Tracy Cotton, I'm so excited to chat with you about relationship marketing because I see you as another poster of pay it forward, help your community, love your community. And we've worked together uh, many times in the past. Well, I appreciate you bringing me on, Martin. I want to start with what is your definition of relationship marketing? What does it mean to you? Well, for me, I think that years back, when I started really working on social media, I realized that beyond the relationships that I build in real life with somebody here in the community that I see on a regular basis, sort of on a board with or interact with on some other level, those kinds of relationships, that there's a much greater opportunity in this time now that we're in to really broaden not only those relationships perhaps, because I know that that does happen, but also reach out to people that you would not be able to reach out to normally. You wouldn't be in the same circles or you wouldn't have that opportunity to be in front of those same people necessarily if you weren't where they were online. And often where they are online is someplace that you have a better access to than getting a $100 charity event ticket perhaps uh, in order to get in front of somebody to get to know them better and maybe hopefully be able to help each other. You really have been in business for a number of years. And, and what I had started with a good ground game as we talk about it. And then I watched you get involved with social media to amplify that and also create other opportunities. So it's a, an additive effect. Actually, it's a multiplying effect if done well, not an additive effect of doing that. And I, I think that's a key piece of uh, relationship marketing on the ground and on the web where you used it to amplify it and to acknowledge people as well. I'd love you to talk about that because you're a big champion of your whole community and, and that's a good place to be. It really has been a, a wonderful experience, experience for me, I think, because when I noticed other people and what they were doing and being able to interact with them, it was just coming from a, a point of curiosity. What is it they're doing? What is it they're about? Uh, as well as getting to know other people in the community and then being able to kind of further connect with them with what they were doing online. When I could see on Facebook or Twitter that they had an event that they had just held or that they had something coming up in their lives, to be able to interact with that to me, gives an opportunity to really develop a relationship that in, in our busy day, we just have a hard time sometimes doing, if not a situation where we are able to interact, you know, online. And of course, you started uh, the, the group that uh, got so successful, now you're meeting virtually because you're, everyone's making so much money now, they, it's hard to get together. But that was a relationship building program you started as it well. Def it definitely was. That was one of the things that also is beneficial, I think, in relationship marketing is it's, your, it's my way of being able to introduce people to each other and connect that opportunity sometimes to, if I know somebody and say, hey, do you know so-and-so? Well, let me put the two of you together. And I've seen that work on Twitter. I've seen it work virtually, but I also, of course, have seen it work in person, which is where we kind of got started when we started the McDowell Marketing Masterminds. We had a room full of people that were just very curious about how to be better marketers in their business. And most of them, that was not their primary job. They, they either owned the business or they managed the business. And then this is something else they know they needed to do, but they really didn't know how. And so that was a great way to kind of bridge that gap. But everybody got to know everybody in the room. We, we learned about each other. People started collaborating on different types of things. And there was a lot that happened just in that room that now is translated into really more of a virtual atmosphere. And we're now seeing that we've got the opportunity to even do more. Uh, I know that more people are able to see it than were before. Before, it was whoever could show up on that Thursday morning once a month, and that might only be 15 people. Sometimes it might be 10 people. Now those same broadcasts that have similar information, and we can bring in a guest, special guest because it's done through Facebook Live, 
They can go back and watch when it's convenient for them. And in some cases, that was an issue. But it also means that more people can now go back in and interact. They can share it. They can do other things with it before that we didn't have that possibility with. And so I don't think it's a disadvantage. I think that it's actually been an advantage for us, just at the very least, because now we've got the, uh, another opportunity we didn't have previously. And we met years ago, and the concept I called it was the technology sharing group, where you get people to start noticing they're experts in your own hometown. You bring in some outsiders, but you also just showcase what, you know, the, the hardware stores crushing it. On Facebook, yeah. if they came in and talked about their clever ways of doing it. I just heard of a hardware store in a small town that's closing down. And I guarantee if they had done what yours were doing, they're same size, same thing, almost no web presence. And if they had done it, there'd be people stopping in and they'd probably still be open. And so you're showcasing the greatness in your own community. It's so easy to look out, to see it there and having an environment you create that showcases that, not just the person who does social media in town. Let's get someone else who succeeded at something good, and let's get the whole tide to raise the town. And that's something you implemented. And then the other piece on this is you've, you notice they're getting so busy, it's hard to get away, so let's let it evolve. And that's a tough thing to do. You can, you can go, wait a second, we're not meeting, but we got 80 members in the group. Isn't that how many in your group now? Yeah. 80 yeah. members in the group, and we got tremendous response. You did a great job with, with Joe on that. We give him a little shout out, too. He's a good guy helping businesses, too. And then also, you got a larger audience. You got a huge response with it. It's knowing when it's time to evolve as well. I totally agree on that. And that's really, I think that that's where I've seen, I have seen social media in general be able to evolve as well that a lot of what I used to do maybe seven or eight years ago is different now than what I'm doing. I noticed that I you know, spent a lot more time worrying about how many followers I had and how many likes I had. And now, as long as it's quality and as long as it's the people that I want to reach, it doesn't have to be a hundred people. I'm certainly not paying to play on some of those types of atmospheres like gaining followers or things like that, because I've just recognized that that wasn't going to really in the end bring me the results that I wanted. I would rather have a smaller amount of people to be able to get in front of consistently and find ways to be valuable to them. Uh, doing a, I do a Facebook live as well as an Instagram live every Friday. It's only five minutes and I do it for my prospects and current clients primarily, although I have lots of friends and family that tune in as well. Mm -hmm. But it's called Fun Fact Friday. Nothing, you know, nothing fancy there. But really, it just talks about things that I know that's facing the, the farm to fork community. These are my type of clients. And I can come up with something just about every week. Sometimes we have to reschedule and so forth. But it's been just a great way to have something out there that they can go back and look at on Facebook, because obviously that was recorded. The Instagram is quicker, but sometimes I can get attention on there that I can't get on Facebook. And with that, I've had an opportunity to actually get in front of some people that I couldn't have cold called probably and gotten a hold of, that they actually have been watching. And I noticed, reached out to them because of it, and it was better than if I just picked up the phone and tried to reach them at their place of business as far as being able to open doors. What are some of the biggest challenges you've seen in relationship marketing over the years? Because you, you've uh, both been bold enough to make some mistakes and learn from them as well. I think that the biggest difficulty is, is really in kind of sifting through who who to who who your audience is and and being kind of guarded with that i mean making sure that you are putting in the time where it needs to be one of the things that joe navarra and i talked about when we had that session earlier in march was that if you go to a networking event that you know is really mostly a room full of people that you're really not necessarily going to be able to help and they may not be able to help you either then you're probably in the wrong room. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things that I've noticed over the years is 
you could get a huge amount of followers, but if they're not the people you really want to interact with, that's like saying yes to everybody that wants to be your friend on link friend connection on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. LinkedIn is a powerful tool for, for relationship marketing, especially business to business. Mm -hmm. But when the people who are trying to connect with you are not people that you know that you can really add anything to, nor there's really any relationship possibilities there. It's just another number that I think is, can be detrimental almost if you are too worried about it or you are spending too much time in the wrong room, as Joe put it. Yeah, yeah, I agree entirely. And that's, to me, uh, what I've taught for over, I guess it's now 13 years, has been narrowcast. Everyone, someone today just said, we want to be number one on Google. I said, no, you don't. You want to be number one for the right customer. That's what you want to be. Yeah. And if you haven't figured out who that is, we need to start there. And that's what I've watched you. I've watched you do it from, you know, Martin, we got big numbers. And I remember saying, are they converting? Is it the client? To you're at these events where I know your customers there and you're, I think I saw you moving hay one day with them or something, unloading something from a truck and saying, these things are heavy, you know, and really understanding where is the, where is the place for the relationship to be built? Where can I add the value to the right people? Because it's, it's fine to help people in general, but call that your own personal tithing. Don't call it a business strategy. True. But you know, one of the things that I think that has really been important for me to learn about, and I've seen you do it, and I've seen a lot of other people that are very successful with it do it, is to interject the personal side of you. Mm -hmm. I know that when I first opened my Instagram account, I thought, this is just, this is just me. This is just me wanting to interact with other people. And after a couple of years, that really honed to where it was me, but there was, it was always going to be a little bit of that possibility of it hopefully reaching somebody who would go, wow, I, I might like to do business with her because she is this kind of person. I see her doing these things and that's really cool. Or I really like her, that trust and, you know, and that, that trust and like that you get, that admiration that you have for each other. You talking about personal type of issues or the other thing that I love about the stuff that you post are the things that you find cool, like seeing somebody picking cotton and actually right. videotaping. That was right. awesome that time or an ocean view or seeing a lake first thing in the morning being up in the mountains and, and the sunrise from, from being there, you know, built more. And those little personal aspects of us, we can't just gloss over. I mean, literally speaking, if my whole message in all of my social media channels was just do business with me, right. number one, it would be miserable. I wouldn't have any fun with it. Right. But number two, I don't think that that would really benefit me in the least. I think that if anything, it would really probably hamper me from being able to really get in front of the clients that I want to get in front of because they would be like, oh, she's just trying to sell me something as opposed to that relationship building that really needs to come first. And that is, I mean, maybe it's a little false. I mean, to an extent, you can't know somebody necessarily just from watching what they post on Facebook, but it is that feeling of seeing that person and understanding what they're about, even if it's just a them watching the sunrise and how you can share that with each other. That's what the relationship marketing is to me. That's excellent. A great description. And what I want to say on that is if they decide they don't want somebody who likes farms, has hair your length and color and a glasses, it's okay. You, yeah. I mean, that sounds funny, but we're so terrified. Oh my God, I might drive someone away. Now at the same time, I want to tell you, Tracy, I'm not for blanket sharing of whatever mood I'm in at the moment because there's a little you know, 12 year old or nine year old that's complaining inside sometimes. And I really don't want to hear him either. So I'm not this advocate of blanket authenticity because there's a part of me I, I really don't want to contribute to. There's, you know, like, well, what, oh, the coffee's cold here. And I'm, you know, it's just, no, it's, uh, I, I talked about this in our social media management class. I want you to be authentic from your commitment and a greater purpose than your inner little whiny child. 
So I do want to add, I do have a bias here. I still call it authentic, but there are different versions. There's a me that, that's complained or, or devastated because I, I had something where someone said, well, it wasn't quite the class I wanted. And I went into a tailspin. And it's like my wife goes, you have 12 people that gave you fives and put a six next to the evaluation. You know, that part of me, yes, part of that's there, but it's also it's okay to have a filter to some extent. And, and I think this is very important. We have the public us, and then we also have the part of us that I call it our shadow side. We need to be conscious of it. We just don't need to feed it. I totally agree. And that's one of the things that I think I see some people going wrong with is, and I advocate for people to, to be, very open if they are comfortable with it about the causes that they represent. Right. If they're, if they're, if they're going out and they're volunteering for an organization in their business. And, and we've seen that. I think that that's something that we try to do and we've had some really great results with because we felt better from doing it. But the side note was we were wearing a shirt that had our name on it and somebody happened to go, hey, I know those people. That's great that they're out here, you know, serving soup or whatever it was. But I don't think that people understand that then there's also an idea of that not everybody's going to love what everybody else loves. And, you know, if I'm going to get on here and I'm going to talk 24-7 about how pets deserve better homes and that I'm a, you know, advocate for making sure that no pet goes hungry. I love my pets and I will show my pets, but I don't want anybody to feel uncomfortable or a, just like selling product. I don't want anybody to feel like somebody's trying to convert them, like trying to convert everybody to your way of thinking is a sure way of making sure that nobody really wants to pay attention to what you're talking about. And so I, I think that you're right. You have to have kind of some boundaries that you put for yourself, but that you also just recognize that there are some times that, you know, it's, it's, it's okay to be, you know, to, to show a little bit of yourself and not have to be polished all the time. You know, I, I used to worry about if I took a picture from hiking, oh, I, I don't have any makeup on. Right. Not necessarily the best light, but typically the mountain behind me was so much more breathtaking. Nobody noticed. <laughs> and those are the kind of things that that self-consciousness that I know people who just like public speaking, they're afraid, so afraid of saying anything that they say nothing. And so I think that that's where I know that it's, it's really helped me just to, to know that it's okay to make some mistakes out there that I might, get on a broadcast, needless to say, and I have, mm -hmm. and said the wrong thing or stuttered a little bit, mm -hmm. had pauses, et cetera. But that if I was being authentic and I was trying to get my message across, that typically that was what was going to come across as opposed to worrying about whether or not I may have repeated myself once or forgot to say something. Yeah, I think that's so important that uh, we recognize that. And to me, the biggest problem I find with good ethical people is they're playing the game. I call it aim, 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 aim. And they're never taking the shot. <laughs> you know, they're, and the bus has left, it's over, they've gone uh, as well. And I, I think you've, you've modeled that really well of the authenticity of your travels, your health commitment. And, and it's just like, I'm struggling with this. Here we go. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to do 12 more laps here or something. You know, this is, this is it. And that humanizes you to round out the picture of letting people having a you to build rapport with, because we really don't buy from a brand. The brand was built on human beings over time. And if we don't keep that going, it's going to die. And I think that's a perfect example of it as well. If you could give a younger version of you a tip on, on networking, what would you provide? What would you say? What would you on relationship marketing, what would you say? I think definitely that I, I probably did play it a little bit too close to the vest at first. I, I had a lot of concern at first about putting myself out online that somehow or another that might not represent the company that I work for because I'm an employee 
And as an employee, I was afraid that perhaps it sounded like I was too self-serving as opposed to knowing that it actually benefited my company to be better at what I was doing. But I think it also was just that I, I wasn't as focused to begin with. It took me a long time to figure out what it is that I really wanted to be about. And I wish that I had gotten started on that sooner. That's something that I know that I've thought about time and time again, because it is something that I'm just so happy and passionate about, about what it is that I do now, that all the years of doing other things, I think I could have been doing it back then. I just didn't know that that's what I wanted to do yet. And so I think that maybe trying different things at first, mm -hmm. and I really just played it so close to the vest for a long time there that I probably missed out on opportunities to have grown and really learned what it was that I wanted to, to do and be about. You know, one of the quotes from uh, Pat Owlett that I love is, in entrepreneurship, fail fast and fail often. Yeah. And, and there's nothing that will tell you this is the right path better than committing to it for a while and seeing if it works because there's no figuring out in your head that that's the right path you got to get the bicycle get on it and and fall in the yard not the concrete find a safe place to ride around the side if you want to ride a bicycle you can't study the bicycle enough to get that it's something you want to do and, uh, and and it doesn't mean you be reckless you find safe environments to test and i'm always testing. I'm always trying new things. I'm always breaking something new. You know, right now I've been working with Alignable to see what results it'll give small businesses. And I, I gave it six months and I saw people get some business. So I'm going to, I'm continuing playing with. And the other piece of relationship marketing that I find is I like that the interaction with people forces me to be a better person. And I love that because I have a drift that will go towards more whining or complaining or whatever else. And I go, I'm not just representing me when I leave the house. I'm re representing a team of people. Now, you should say, oh, you should be noble enough that that's enough. Well, I'm not. You're not always. You know, sometimes it's just not enough. But I walking out and I represent you when I'm online. I represent because we work together. There's a relationship. I represent all the people that have said, given me testimonials over the years. You know, all of that goes into it. And I like that. I call it boxing people in to be a better person phenomenon of it as well. And I think you were talking about that kind of does it. And I don't know if you have that version, but I know I do, you know? Well, and I think that what you're saying there is just that, you know, being conscientious of that you really, in any interaction, and that's one of those things where I think other, other kind of things come into play with the relationship marketing where because being online can be somewhat anonymous in theory, people say and do things sometimes not realizing that how it comes across, uh, how it may actually play out. And so knowing that, you know, trying to put that into that positive spin as much as possible and not let the negativity come out because you know that somebody did recommend you. And so when somebody reaches out to you for the first time in an email, if you're brusque or you're dismissive, you may have missed an opportunity with somebody that maybe even it seems like it's a small opportunity right then. And you're like, oh, I just don't really have time for this. Having the right attitude in every interaction, whether it be a small, you know, very small thing, whether it's a post on a, somebody's Instagram or whether or not it is, you know, it's something much broader than that. It's that idea that you are trying to, to make sure and put your best foot forward to make sure that you are representing yourself, your company, your, your other referral partners and everyone else around you properly. Uh, one more thing that I think is important is that when people have, have worked at more of a corporate job and then get in on their own, because even though you work for a company, you have a, a lot of, uh, you operate from my perspective, almost like an independent salesman on your own or independent person. They give a lot of autonomy and that can actually create a certain level of isolation. And I see 
building these strategic alliance and relationship marketing is a way to disrupt it. Now, would you talk a little bit about that as well? Well, I will say that one of the things that you were talking about isolation, I know that for myself, what I've also had to do is seek out people who are like-minded, even in my own field. And I'm here to tell you, I've been doing insurance for a long time now, and it used to be that you didn't talk to the guy down the street, and you certainly didn't talk to somebody who was doing the same thing you were. That was a no-no because they were your competition. You, you shouldn't talk to them. You shouldn't deal with them. And now I think more people are realizing, and I know for myself personally, that the motivation that I can get and give in those kinds of safe relationships that I've been able to develop, and some of them online, have been extremely helpful when I felt like nobody who was maybe close to me really understood where I was coming from. Perhaps I wanted to do some sort of new type of something like Snapchat print, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Well, if nobody else in my, in my closest group even knew what that was or was interacting with it, then I felt like the Lone Ranger. Or if because of the kind of jobs that we have sometimes, we're on the road a lot or we're not necessarily always in a situation where we can just talk to somebody across a cubicle, the idea that you've got a peer support group of some sort, I think can be extremely beneficial, even if it, they are in the same field of you know, industry that you are as well. Somebody else is another coach. Even if you both are basically coaching the same type of people, how awesome is it when you actually can kind of feed off of each other and kind of build each other up because it's really all ships rise kind of opportunity I think we have now. And certainly what I bring to the table, even for somebody else who's literally doing the same types of things that I am, it's going to be different because they're a different individual and always watching out for what somebody else is doing instead of actually trying to interact and get to know them better has been extremely beneficial for me because it's, it gives me more self-confidence and it keeps me from feeling that isolation that I think that we can sometimes feel even in our own organizations if we're not surrounded by like-minded people. There are two great things you brought up on this I'll bring up. One is if you've really done your homework on what is your unique offering, your real unique offering, you actually have no competition in a sense. Yeah. Okay. And number two is something we, we name and use in my training program. We could talk about it as co-opetition. And I was really one of the pioneers in my community doing that. And really Greg Hire, as you know, that passed away, he was competition selling LinkedIn training 50, 12 years ago or 13 years ago. And I reached out to him and I go, you know, we can compete or we can work together. And, and there's a great person in the area that reached out to me that's now doing a lot of LinkedIn, Deborah, in the training. And she, she just sent a note, it's time for us to do something together. And we'll work out what it is. And, and Karen that I work with in teaching social media management at State, we could be viewed and really were competing. And so that's a piece, but this doesn't mean you go, well, here's my entire Rolodex and my list of clients, you know, <laughs> you aren't, so you are finding that proper distance and that the, the challenge with that, Tracy, I've learned is some people tragically were brought up in an environment that forced them into a black and white world. And they do have to break that down and learn it. I've successfully done that one-on-one -on -one with people. Often uh, what I've learned is people who tragically were in a very extreme alcoholic upbringing where they aren't that, they were forced for survival to put everything in the world in black and white. And it's very hard to build these relationships in that context. Uh, but, but I've successfully coached people through that on it, and that's where you got to learn of the grace. What is the distance of working with this person that works for me and them? It might be close. It might be a little further away. It might be across the planet. It's okay. And I, I think that was a great point you brought up is understanding and developing strategic allies, the anatomy of co-opetition. And I talk about that as well, and, and great, great point to reiterate. What, 
would you, what's your final recommendation for relationship marketing for somebody uh, that, that goes, I, I want, because to me, relationship marketing is really a structured way of doing it, not a serendipity, not a hopeful way. It is an actual structured method. What would be your advice from your years of experience on it to close with? And then I want to know how people can reach you and learn about what you do more. I think that one of the things that I really, the people need to focus on if they're really looking to give some structure to it is it's, it's super easy to get distracted and just, you know, like watching their cat video. But if they really want to make the most of the time that they have when they are on, you know, online looking at is, is recognizing who it is that they want to reach and how that might actually be able to happen. How can you make it happen? Is it keeping up with them and, and making sure to share when you see that they're doing something really good that you know that you believe in too and that they can see that you shared? And then you have that little, oh, that oh moment of who is this? Who is this that I'm talking to? I have a, a close friend, I mean a very close friend of mine and she has been an excellent referral and resource over the last few years that literally it's just because we kept on crossing paths on Twitter. And she saw that I was like in the same chats that she was. And she saw me retweeting some of the things that she had a relationship developed from that. And that is something that you, you have to be a little bit, you have to be a little strategic about. I certainly knew that I wanted to get to know her better, did not realize that it was something that would be so beneficial to us after several years of interacting. But just knowing that this is somebody that I wanted to pay attention to and putting that little bit of extra time into it. You know, if I had just been, you know, showing up when I showed up and never actually kind of, you know, being in the right circle, she never would have noticed me. But now, you know, we've, we've developed a really close friendship from it. And it, so it is kind of serendipity in being in the right place at the right time, but you can be very strategic about that. And especially in the way that the, you know, the social media is structured now, you can find those times that you know that somebody might be more likely to be or where they're more likely to be if you know who it is that you want to interact with and develop those relationships with. So that's, that's probably my biggest takeaway is that is really is becoming more strategic about it, even if it doesn't look it, uh, but also just recognizing that I, I had to be more focused about what I was wanting out of it in order to be able to achieve any results. That sounds great. How can people learn more about you and what, what you have to offer and what is your domain of working in? I am a farm to fork insurance agent here in West North Carolina and I regularly post about those type of topics on my agent page, my business page, uh, which is Tracy L. Cotton. Uh, on Facebook, as well as, and I think I actually may have changed that to Insurance Wise Tracy to match It's Wise Tracy on Instagram. And that's I N S W I S E Tracy. And then I am Tracy L. Cotton on Twitter. I'm very active on Twitter. That's actually where I found out by accident there's a ton of agriculture topics going on on Twitter at any given time. Never knew that ag Twitter was a thing, but that's one of the places that I found a lot of great connections, uh, both in the United States and Canada, even through, through, through Twitter. I, I just do a lot on those. Those are probably my, my key places that I, I interact. I do LinkedIn, of course. Mm -hmm. and uh, as well as I have you know, some other blogs and so forth. But that's the best places to find me is pretty much Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. We'll, we'll send me, we'll get the links and put yes. them in the channel below. So look in the comment area below. This, this is uh, going on YouTube so you can get all of them. And also, if we were looking out for customers for you, tell us what, what they look like. Are they all over the world? Is it North Carolina? Is it farmers? Is it uh, organic farmers? What, what's your customer look like? My customer is really in the farm to fork niche of North Carolina, primarily. That's where I do most of my business. And it's somebody who 
is really maybe if they're a farmer, hopefully there's somebody who wants to interact with restaurants, breweries, and other places to actually wholesale their produce, their fruits, their vegetables, etc. Because that's actually some place that I also write. So I might be able to connect a blueberry farmer to a local brewery that regularly wants to use blueberries in their beer. And those are the kind of connections that I can make, as well as I do also have the right insurance solutions for those types of customers. I work with food manufacturers, farmers, restaurants, brewers, because that's the atmosphere that I enjoy the most, but it's also the one that I found to be very successful for me in being able to really serve them better. Outstanding. And I have someone, once we get offline, I'm going to talk to you about to see if it's a good introduction just from there from that reiterating well thank you so much and if people found this useful check the links below and i highly recommend following what tracy's doing she's a, a pay it forward from the fundamental person that loves her community and what i state is i've watched her in action if you are looking for any insurance with this at least let Tracy go over with it because what I can tell you about you is if it's not the right match, you introduce them to who is the right match. Yeah. And that's the thing uh, that I view as your high ethical sales practice. You know, I, I, you need to go over here. It's a better deal. And that's, that's to me really serving the customer. Thanks so much. I appreciate it, Martin. Thank you.